This week on Maker Update, a special episode from the show floor at the 2019 Game Developers Conference in San Francisco, we'll take a look at some of the most interesting maker-made games from the Alt Control Showcase. Hey, I'm Donald Bell, and welcome to a very special Maker Update. I'm here at one of my favorite Maker events of the year, the Alt Control Showcase at GDC. It's full of experimental video games and controllers and groups flying from all over the world to showcase here. And when you see the games and what's under the hood, you'll understand why this is definitely a maker event. So let's go check out the games and the makers behind them. So, Hot Swap. Tell me about Hot Swap. Well, Hot Swap is a cooperative pirate ship survival game where you have to assemble the controller as you play. And each player has uh, control of one half of the ship, so you have to trade parts of the controller between the partners to sort of succeed. And then tell me about uh, how you conceive the design for the, the game controller. So, um, Peter attended one of my, I'm, I'm doing a PhD, and Peter attended one of my research talks. Um, and I was uh, looking into magnets and how magnets could make like haptic and functional, tangible interfaces. And Peter came up to me and like, we should make a game. And what if we took a controller and pop off all the inputs and, and players had to rearrange the inputs as they are playing. And that kind of birthed the idea of uh, the hot swap controller. And so we were iterating quite a bit on like what are the different kinds of inputs. And when we settled on a, a pirate ship game, it became clear that you know we had to have a helm, we had to have a crank to raise and lower the sails, um, we had to have a key to open the treasure, we had to have like a hatch to load the cannons, and a fuse to fire the cannons. And so like it kind of came naturally once like we had a concept in mind, and then we started to 3D model the, the controllers and 3D print them and assemble them. Yeah. I have to say, uh, for it being pirate themed, I think the, the interface is very like modern and sleek and like 3D printed, and I, you know, it, does, it doesn't scream pirate, but the, the gameplay is a lot of fun. So now, uh, aside from the 3D printing, what's really interesting is the, the, the way that you've conceived and assembled the controllers, right? You're using, you're not using kind of off the shelf rotary encoders. There's, there's a really interesting hidden element to these. Do you want to talk about that a little bit here? Yeah, so my research project uh, on this topic is called Macro Magnets, and essentially it's looking at, um, you know, kind of like this artificial constraint, what if you only had a 3D printer and magnets? How many different kinds of inputs can you build with uh, just these very simple inventory? And so we figured that actually with magnets and with 3D printing spatial constraints, you could create a variety of like really tactile inputs from buttons to sliders to knobs. And what's more, because you're using magnets, you could use uh, linear Hall effect sensors to sense the position of the magnets. So instead of uh, embedding an off-the-shelf button or an off-the-shelf rotary encoder, everything could be 3D printed with embedded magnets, and then the position of these magnets could be read with these Hall effect sensors to get, you know, rotation, um, you know, kind of direction, um, uh, and, and even like things like button presses, uh, stuff like that. Yeah. When I'm looking at these, I'm thinking that there's going to be like a potentiometer in some of these that I'm turning, or just some kind of simple tactile uh, single pull switch on some of these. But they're they're all really when you open them up, they're all little magnets that are embedded in the 3D print, and then a Hall effect sensor to be able to read the position of where that magnet is. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, we have a taxonomy, so we essentially identify. 25 different kinds of uh, inputs that you can build with this technique. And so Hot Swap was built on top of that taxonomy. And you know, essentially it's about mixing and, ma and matching these different inputs. And what's more, you can create like inputs that don't exist yet, right? So like the hatch, for instance, is an input that no one has ever seen before. But you know, with this technique, we could make such novel inputs. Yeah. And so uh, the other part of this is the swappability, right? So tell me about how you, you've handled being able to swap out the different elements. I think so each component has the same PCB at the bottom. It's just got six conductive pads that connect to uh, pogo pins, which are in the base of the controller. And there's like a little magnetic connection that sort of clicks them in nice. Uh, and all that we do to identify each component is have a little resistor that we're re reading on each end. And so between the controllers, you can swap them around, and it'll always know which input you're moving once it's inserted. That's really cool. And so, and then all of them are being fed into uh, a, a computer at some point, right? They go through uh, an Arduino Micro, uh, and that just goes straight into the computer. That's great. And so, is the computer reading them as like an HID input or some kind? Or they're just looking the? What's the software looking at when uh, from the the computer's point of view? 
So it's just a serial port packet that we sort of define ourselves and we're parsing with our application on the front end. We do as little processing of like the actual input data on the Arduino because that would be a little bit slower, especially when we're doing the sine and cosine functions for some of the inputs. Uh, so really we're just sending it straight to the computer over a quick serial port message and parsing it there. All right, and I'd be doing a bad job if I didn't ask about the game. How did you guys build the game? How do we build the game? We made it with JavaScript, actually. So uh, I've always struggled with Unity's sort of way of getting serial reading into there, but Node.js really has a great uh, way to parse it. You can just use strings, and it's super easy. So we're using Electron, which is a desktop environment developed by GitHub that's sort of built on top of the Chrome browser, and all that's just bundling JavaScript together and letting it run. Well, it's a lot of fun to play, and I appreciate you guys making this, this game and bringing it here. And I'm excited to see how other people make use of the technology that you, you built with the, the, the magnet. So thanks for talking to me. Cool, thank you. All right, Henry, tell me about Continuum Bacterium. What's the game like? Uh, so Continuum Bacterium is actually a game built around these uh, helmets, these safety helmets. And the tech that's kind of behind it, uh, I don't know if you guys got a glimpse of it, but they're flickering on and off. And they're actually alternating between what's on and what's off, thus creating like a left eye, right eye, kind of stereoscopic, but split across two people. So one person sees one thing and the other person sees another, yet they're both looking at the same screen. So that requires them to kind of communicate about what they're doing, what they're uh, seeing on the screen, so that they can actually wipe out all the bacteria on the screen, which is what Continuum Bacterium is about. Bacteria on the time continuum. What was the moment where you thought like face shields was going to be the, 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 the way into having a unique game? Uh, I, you know, I was thinking like I, I do a lot of fabrication for my work uh, and there's always like this idea about a wearable, right? Uh, or the costuming of it and the framework of the helmet kind of really lended itself to kind of like having things attached to it, putting something in the front. So there was a lot that could be done just using it as like a, a vehicle or a vessel to color it, add things to it, add controls. So that was really kind of where it came from. And, that, and then walk me through the different inputs. Uh, so on the helmet, let me pick it up. So on the helmet, uh, we have uh, the knob on the side here, which uh, cycles through different channels of bacteria that you can see. Um, and there's also a watch. So keep in line with the theme of time. There's a, a wristwatch, right, that's attached on here, and you would cycle through, um, or sorry, you would rotate your turret using this knob on the, on the side, and then you would fire the turret using this button in the center. So kind of all built to this time kind of narrative, and uh, that's why the wristwatch is kind of the, the other control. And then the, uh, both of the, the potentiometers here, they're also like push, they're also like a push button, right? They're actually rotary encoders, yeah, so there's actually a push button on it. So this one, the button isn't uh, doing anything, but the button on this one actually does. So when uh, both players sync up and they have enough ammunition, they can actually do a, like a big bomb purge and kind of do like a three, two, one, and then have the whole screen be cleared uh, when they hit down on this button. And then the other really unique feature here is the the, the privacy screen, right? That, that, that switches on and off. What was the... What brought you to that material? Uh, I've actually never used it before, and I, I just turn on real quick just to let you see it turn on and off. But uh, it's slow, relatively slowly turning on and off right now because I can increase that speed. But the problem is, there's a reason why I have epilepsy warnings uh, on the table here. You know, so uh, obviously this can be uncomfortable for some people. Um, but I never used it before, but I'd seen it been used. Um, for things like a conference room wall or like a, a bathroom privacy filter. So it was an interesting thing to try to use. I'd never used it before. Uh, and this kind of gave me the opportunity to use both the helmet and the film at the same time. Can you talk, walk me through what, what elements are in here? Uh, yeah, um, actually the there's a 12, um, there's 12 uh, uh, NeoPixel LEDs. And you know, quite a lot of us who use addressable LEDs are familiar with uh, these types of LEDs. It's really kind of decorative right now because um, I realize not many people are focusing on the watch when they're playing the game. They're not looking down at their hand, they're just looking at the screen. Um, and to the point where someone else said like they weren't even looking at the UI on the sides of the screen. They're just so focused at the very center of it. So definitely it's a decorative element uh, kind of there to kind of add you know some sparkle to, to the piece. But it's, um, 
it's just aluminum uh, channel that was a square channel actually that was cut in half and then used to bolt together uh, four layers of quarter inch uh, plastic which were all individually kind of cut and hollowed to kind of create cavities for the different sort of controls that we're going to go into all of them. Yeah. And then tell me about what it's all feeding into. It's, uh, what's, what's kind of processing the input and how is it, how is it getting to the computer? Sure. Uh, so the, it, it, we're using Arduino and we're using that to communicate to Unity via serial. Uh, and that's actually bi-directional. So in that sense, we have all the inputs, uh, you know, encoder turns, uh, button pushes, that's being sent to the um, Arduino, which is sending that to uh, Unity via serial. And at the same time, Unity via serial is sending back, uh, transmitting to the Unity, uh, to, sorry, Arduino, for when the uh, screen should be turning on and off, or when the privacy film should be turning on and off. So communication both ways. Yeah. That's great. Well, it's a lot of fun to play. It was, it was really exciting to see this game here. And I, I love seeing what you come to all control with. So thanks for showing it to us. Thanks to you again. Yeah. Talk to me about Machinaria. Okay. So Machinaria is a game, uh, a critic to how media manipulates information and manipulates people through that. It's, it's a game that we're developing in a fictional world where everything is like 90s, but technology is more technological. <laughs> so uh, this machine was created by MCorp, that is a company that exists in our world. And it's a, a machine created to, man to manipulate news. So they sell this machine to TV channels and they use the machine to manipulate people. The machine takes a, a, an event and takes all the relevant information and depending how you organize it on the way that is going to be broadcast in TV, it predicts how people is going to feel and how are they going to be affected by, by how the news are presented. But it's kind of like a dystopian future, retro future, where you're, the people are being, the operators are paid to, to manipulate the media to to get, to get people in line, on board with the kind of the corporate messaging, right? And what made you think about that, uh, the, the, the 90s kind of throwback, um, the, the retro feel of the whole thing? I don't know, a mix between nostalgia, like for the cyberpunk stuff, the vaporwave style, the vaporwave style is very relevant in our, in our game, and the, the vaporwave, uh, like movement is also a, a little contestatory and a little against the the machine. Yeah. So yeah, we, we just sit around thinking how we would communicate uh, how media really is relevant and is manipulating us in South America. We are from Colombia and here in the States and we wanted to, to find a way to do it with a game. So we sit and we realize that all this is like a machine. So we said, why well, don't create in a machine to <laughs> take that, take data from that machine and be able to manipulate that machine? Inception of, of machines. Talk to me about uh, the decision to uh, what, what your decision to have the kind of the two separate styles of of buttons and and how you thought about uh, representing the different puzzles and, and all that. Okay, so uh, we we built the first prototype of the game that is uh, the, the company created this, this machine for the first time and tried it in a third world country. And in this machine, it, we used cartridges. So we wanted to be uh, coherent in the evolution of the machine. So we said like, why not using like arcade buttons to select the material instead of cartridges? And then we, as, as we prototyped the machine, we discovered different tools that would help us bring a, a, a better experience and a more coherent aesthetic with the, idea of the game and the bigger game that we're building. So yeah, basically we, we prototype a lot and we, draw, we do a lot of drawings and say like, oh, we wanted to, to go uh, in a similar way that the, the machine in the game was built. To be, yeah, to be like uh, true to the game, I don't know. That's great. And then under the hood is uh, a Raspberry Pi or what's working underneath? A Raspberry Pi and, and two Arduino Pro Micro. Uh, and they, they have, they, they are separated in, in modules. So one module is controlled, everything is controlled by the Raspberry Pi, and in, in another two modules is controlled by the Pro Micros. The Pro Micros can communicate to Raspberry Pi, and it's pretty much it. The game runs in, in Pi game and Python 3. Yeah. 
And then is the uh, is the game going to be available for people to play around with uh, if they wanted to check it out or where could they learn more? Uh, there's uh, uh, at itch.io there's already a playable prototype that is downloadable for free and that's open source as, as the machine, the machine is open source too. Everything is in GitHub and in, at itch.io. Yeah. It's great, okay. It's a lot of fun to play, I want to play it again. Thanks for talking to me. Hellcouch. Hellcouch. Talk to me about Hellcouch. So Hellcouch is the first ever couch co-op game where the couch is the controller. And there's essentially there's a demon that's trapped inside of it and you have to use your butt to perform the sacred butt ritual to release the demon and allow it to possess other couches throughout the world. It's a pretty old concept. I mean, I feel like I've heard this one a million it's times. A it's a classic. No, really, but how did you come up with this idea for Hellcouch? Like what was where were you coming from where you thought, you know what, I want a couch video game? Um, I, well, I was, uh, we took a class at NYU, my design partner and I, Francesca and I, uh, were taking a class called Beyond the Joystick at NYU under uh, our instructor Kaho Abe, and she taught us how to do all kinds of really fun stuff with Arduino and sensors and things, and we were like, this is amazing, we want to do more, what if we made a couch co-op game where the couch was the controller? And um, we pitched it to uh, our professors at NYU, and they were like, yes, absolutely. And we worked on it for a semester, and it was um, just super, super fun. So it's Unity, it's Arduino, and it's just sensors and LED lights that uh, control the entire experience. Right, well, we love talking hardware, so yeah. I want to hear more than just sensors and Arduino. Okay. Rock me through, uh, uh, what's detecting the sacred butt ritual? The sacred butt ritual is detected not only by the demon himself, but also by handmade pressure sensors. So um, we use uh, craft foam, uh, conductive tape, and Velostat. Um, so you can find like basically instructions for these kinds of pressure sensors all over the internet, and they're fantastic because it's essentially an analog signal that you're sending. So um, we're essentially using it as a button, like an on-off switch or something, um, but we could theoretically detect how hard people are sitting on the couch and things like that, uh, which opens up a lot of space for playfulness, but in this... But, but velocity. But velocity, you know, but, but mass. <laughs> Maybe sometimes, um, but in this case, but in this case, um, the the design of the game only needed us to have basically a zero one situation coming from those sensors. So it works out really well. So that's being fed to an Arduino, Uno, or Micro, or something like that yeah. as like an analog input. Yeah. So we're just using an Uno to control everything, um, and we're hooking the Uno into a uh, a computer that's running a Unity project. So we've we've created a Unity game. That's what's controlling all the sound. That's what's actually controlling the gameplay itself. Um, because our, our background is in digital games, and so we're comfortable programming in Unity. Uh, is it coming in as like a keyboard input or like a serial input, or do you know how? Um, it's coming in as a serial input, um, but we also have it so you can control it by keyboard. So I am like master at you know using WASD to control Hellcouch. <laughs> and then you've also got the uh, your your addressable light strip that's coming out there. That's the real way that people are seeing where they need to place their butts right. and like uh, how the demon's lighting them, right? So exactly. So there's there's no screen at all. So the 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 only input it, or the only feedback rather is the audio and the LED lights. Um, and so yeah, the LEDs are also just being controlled by the Arduino. Um, we're using the fast LED uh, plug-in for Arduino and it's just made it so much. It's got a nice like fire effect kind of yeah. built in, right? Yeah. And then fog machine. Yes. Eventually a fog machine comes out, right? I don't want to spoil it, but you know, okay. And then how are you triggering the fog machine off of the gameplay? Um, so we wound up uh, using the Rock Band Stage Kit fog machine, which is controlled using an S-Video cable that I was able to just cut and um, there's two of the wires inside the S-Video cable are what control the fog, so we hooked it into a relay and we're just triggering that through the Arduino. Um, and it, it was easier than we expected because when we were like, hell couch, well now we definitely have to hack a fog machine. Um, I was a little terrified at what that would mean and Googled a little bit on how to hack a fog machine and then we discovered that the, the stage kit was super hackable and we're really excited about that. All right, and where can people learn more about Hellcouch? Uh, we actually have a website, hellcouch.com, 
Um, and Francesca and I, the two creators, are both online. Um, so Francesca Carletto Leon and I'm Carol Mertz. You can Google us. We're on. Uh, we have portfolios up. We have Twitters. We are on the internet. We live there. We're millennials. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you for making Hell Couch. It's a lot of fun to play. Yeah, thank you so much. We appreciate you uh, talking to us about it. So there you go. That's a look at some of the one-of-a-kind games you're going to find here at All Control GDC. You can find more information on these games using the links down in the description. You can also find links to the games we covered at last year's show. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.